Hello, I'm Marty McFly, time-traveling dachshund. You may know me from my previous guest appearances on Guys from the Future. Current time Jeff is busy with other real-life issues, and so I'm filling in until future Jeff gets here. He's a bit late, as is common with time travelers. They're all... If I don't get there at the right time, I'll just hop back in my time machine and go to the right time. But then they're all crap. I can't cross my own timeline. And trust me, if you paid attention to our canon, you know those Turks take time crime seriously. Hi, sorry I'm late. As you can tell, I'm from the future as I'm filming from a slightly different location of the apartment. I would like to take care of this video, however I have a lunch appointment with slightly less future me and President Reagan too. Hey, future Jeff, you ready to go? Yeah, just give me a second to wrap this up. It's been on our schedule for quite a while, it'd be kind of sad if we missed it. Anyways, we're working with President Reagan too to develop a missile defense system for the Galilean moons in order to protect them from those communists over at NASA. So today, in honor of all those men's rights advocates, I'm proud to announce Feminist Friday, where we honor women in our history who work to advance gender equality. Now, while I have to go meet with ultra-feminist Reagan too, who also thinks mras are degenerate piles of scum, I've contracted with a much less future version of Jeff to do today's video. Hello, today's Feminist Friday honors Margaret Fuller, author, activist, journalist. Her work would even be instrumental in instigating the American Civil War. Margaret Fuller gave her voice to the early feminist movement in America, producing some of its earliest texts like women in the 19th century. As she was also a transcendentalist, Ralph Waldo Emerson asked her to be the editor of The Dial, a transcendentalist journal. After working at The Dial, she took a position with Horace Greeley's New York Tribune, where she was the first female editor and the first full-time literary critic in America. In 1846, she would become the Tribune's first female foreign correspondent when she traveled to Europe, specifically England and then Italy. Hey, you're supposed to be reading from the script. Otherwise it won't seem authentic. Yeah, but current Jeff would know this stuff. He's written multiple papers on Margaret Fuller. Fine, continue then. Now, for some historical context. A common view of the time period between the fall of Napoleon and World War I is encapsulated in the idea of the Pax Britannica that an era of peace descended upon Europe under the rise of the British Empire. However, 11 major and separate revolutions sparked up across Europe in 1848, one of which was the beginning of the long struggle of the Italian people, which eventually culminated in the formation of the Italian state. Concurrent to these revolutions, the United States had just concluded the Mexican-American War, which figured prominently in many of Margaret Fuller's admonishments of the United States. Returning to Fuller, Larry Reynolds sets out his case for Margaret Fuller's militarism in his article, Righteous Violence. Fuller's support of political violence in Europe prefigured a major change in anti-slavery thinking in the United States and influenced the pro-war attitudes of some of its most important northern intellectual advocates. Fuller's writings would help influence the transcendentalists to give up their nonviolent resistance, instead adopting the methods of the European underclass as they fought against government institutions that both enslaved them and promoted imperialism across the world. Part of Fuller's transition towards violence, aside from her experiences in Italy, was due to her feelings that America had betrayed its ideals. In her letter from December of 1847, she says, I listen to the same arguments against the emancipation of Italy that are used against the emancipation of our blacks. The same arguments in favor of the spoliation of Poland as for the conquest of Mexico. I find the cause of tyranny and wrong everywhere the same, and lo, my country the darkest defender." This view led her to reconsider her position on abolitionists in America, saying, "...how it pleases me here to think of the abolitionists. I could never endure to be with them at home. They were so tedious, often so narrow, always so rabid and exaggerated in their tone. But after all, they had a high motive, something eternal in their desire and life. And if it was not the only thing worth thinking of, it was really something worth living and dying for, to free a great nation from such a terrible blot, such a threatening plague. God strengthen them and make them wise to achieve their purpose." While Margaret Fuller did not have much direct participation with the American abolitionist movement, having died on a return trip to the United States in 1850 when her boat sank off of Fire Island, she did help influence one of the most important revolutionary acts in American history. Harper's Ferry. John Brown, a militant abolitionist, made his name through his involvement in Bleeding Kansas and Harper's Ferry. While his connection to Fuller is not obvious and certainly not well known, his attack on Harper's Ferry was funded by a group called the Secret Six. Of the six, Thomas Wentworth Higgins wrote a biography of Fuller. Among the group, she also worked with Theodore Parker. And Samuel Howe was married to Julia Ward Howe, 
a student of Fuller's who idolized John Brown and Fuller. Julia Howe would later pen The Battle Hymn of the Republic, which referenced the turmoils in Europe, and she also wrote a biography on Fuller. All six men who funded the raid were transcendentalist and familiar with Fuller's work. Also, from those who wrote about Fuller's works, they explicate how her writings influenced them towards justified violence. Even Emerson, who was staunchly opposed to violence, was eventually swayed by Fuller. Harper's Ferry would help to convince the South that Northern abolitionists were involved in a vast terrorist conspiracy. This, in turn, would help lead to the militarization of the South. This is not to say that Fuller caused the Civil War, only that she had some minor influence on its occurrence. States' rights to own slaves, the consolidation of power within northern industry, and the unrest among the lower classes all factored into the causing of America's bloodiest conflict. And now for a brief message from one of the guys from the future's Constitutional Committee voting members. So, Thad and Vicky, if you're watching this, I just wanted to let you know that I got into Arizona State University and I have a full assistantship for film and media studies. Thaddeus, I will see you in the future. But as to sing the glory of the gods from the future, they are trampling out the ignorance wherever it is found. They have lost the knowledge of a hundred thousand books. They